Thank you everyone for joining. We'll go ahead and get started. A little background on Nano. We launched an immersive real-time collaboration platform for scientific discovery, and we're changing the way we understand and interact with science at the molecular level. The software enables people to visualize, modify, and simulate proteins, chemical compounds, and nucleic acids to accelerate scientific decision-making. The platform facilitates effective communication of data and integrates with existing computational chemistry workflows. We're a San Diego-based company whose enterprise solution has been adopted by several pharmaceutical and biotech companies worldwide. Genentech has been a customer since late 2018. We've worked together with a tight feedback loop to iterate on the development of the platform as he introduced us to many of his colleagues in medicinal chemistry, computational chemistry, and other structural biologists. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Seth Harris. Um, and uh, his background. So Dr. Seth Harris is a, a the director of computational structural biology um, and is a distinguished scientist at Genentech. Dr. Harris is a structural biologist focusing on structure-based drug design, graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a PhD in molecular and cell biology. Dr. Harris conducted his research as a postdoc at UCSF and at Roche, focusing on structural studies and viral proteins. In 2009, he joined the Structural Biology Group at Genentech and has been working on advanced small molecules and biologic discovery projects in neurodegeneration, oncology, angiogenesis, metabolism, cancer immunotherapy, and infectious diseases. Additionally, he develops computational tools and infrastructure to support the production and analysis of protein structures. Thank you, Seth, for joining us today. Thanks. And yeah, we'll go ahead and um, transition over the presentation to you. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks to, to be here with Edgardo, and thanks to the rest of NanoM as well for the invitation and uh, kind of the collaboration over the years, as Edgardo said. It's great having seen them go from uh, kind of this energetic, smaller startup to an energetic, bigger uh, force in, in the field. And I'm really happy to present some of the ways we've been thinking about how to use NanoM. So my talk is going to focus a bit on <clears throat> the platform we've been building at Genentech uh, to basically look at structures in a way that's uh, more on mass, like traditionally, we always look at structures individually, right? You kind of dive in deep and look at the details, but there haven't been as many tools that look at them um, hundreds at a time or thousands at a time until, as people have seen, all these machine learning and AI methods that are coming out. And so in the background, if you see the atoms colors changing, that's really meant to evoke the idea that all of these atoms and structures really have tons of information locked inside them, right? Tons of information. And uh, we want to develop some tools that help bring that out and make it available to people, whether visually in these kind of data overlays or programmatically and accessible through APIs, uh, ultimately to provision machine learning models to kind of accelerate and transform how we do drug discovery. So I'm going to describe some of that, which will hopefully show uh, kind of in the philosophies we've been thinking about how we design and work with data, why the visualizations in Nanome and the VR world were such a kind of logical and compelling partner uh, in, in this type of uh, investigation and explorations that we do. So jumping forward to just a, again, <clears throat> basic background, right? But that all these interactions, why we're after them, uh, it's not just the protein folding problem, but really the interactions between molecules that underlie all of biology. And pretty much every therapeutic we make, whether large molecule antibodies, small molecule drugs, uh, compounds, <clears throat> they're really all aiming to modulate some type of interaction, right? Whether to improve it, stabilize it, compete with it, change localization. Um, and so, what we wanted to do ultimately we're trying to do is understand the language of these interactions right um, but to do that it's of course uh, complex and been kind of a multi-decade issue where just solving a structure alone doesn't yet tell us kind of we can immediately make a drug that fits that pocket and for small molecule world i like to show this example where you know the possible drug-like chemical space of the size of those molecules is something like 10 to the 60th which for all intents and purposes, is essentially infinite. This is one of those numbers of atoms in the universe type uh, values, right? And so no, <clears throat> all the computers running all the time can't even enumerate all those possibilities. And so even though we all you know, brag about our big HTS libraries, they're essentially invisibly small compared to that type of space. So we can't make computational tools that 
catalog all of this either, but we certainly feel like we could, um, you know, make tools that help do the heavy lifting and get us further in exploring these these spaces. And people have seen the kind of these ultra throughput docking now with billions of molecules instead of um, a few million, for instance. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes I'm all surprised we do as well as we do uh, when we sit in a room and think, what about an oxetane in there, uh, pyr pyrimidine, you know, that's 10 to the 60th minus one, but still so many other options. So that's kind of some of the motivation behind it, again, to kind of build these computational tools. And, uh, you know, some five or six years ago, we really started putting together the pieces to make GIST, which was this platform that was meant to um, not just be a catalog, but start being able to recommend and find relationships between structures that weren't as obvious necessarily as just the sequence. Um, you know, like, you know, you have a few structures of a similar protein, you can kind of compare those. But can we learn from more distant relationships and bring those to the forefront for people to maybe serendipitously discover things that they wouldn't otherwise see? So again, it's not meant to replace like the human role in creativity, but it was meant to augment it and support it and kind of be like a, a Sherpa that does the heavy lifting as you go through these landscapes of data and structures. Um, so this is just a schematic of what, what it does. It basically pulls in all the structures we can get our hands on from the public PDB, from our internal ones. And more recently, we're adding AlphaFold uh, models or you know, OpenFold and other folds that are available now. And it's only since those seminal advances people are probably aware of in the, the accuracy of predictions that they've kind of earned a seat alongside the structures in kind of our in consideration, I think. But, but those are fantastic. It greatly you know, increases the coverage of what we have information for. Then those are then parsed and taken apart and uh, you know, relationships established. And, it's one place I'd like to mention is kind of like these twofold benefits. One is the fact that when you go to whatever structure you used to look at, there's just more information now, there's more calculations done, but that's still somewhat of a traditional approach to structure analysis. And then the other side of the coin is that because we've pre-calculated all these things, um, you know, there's three quarters of a million macro, separate macromolecular chains that we've looked at. There's millions of protein-protein interfaces, 20 million protein ligand vectors that are documented. That's the type of data that we want to provision to machine learning. And all of these things are tied, uh, you know, seamlessly to kind of the, the 3D molecular world to be able to look at the data in, in these various the various parts as well. Um, and again, it's it's meant to then help you along and give you recommendations that are kind of based on these algorithms and that can be brought in. So this is a quick snapshot of our web page. Um, again, this kind of idea of a landscape that we're we're working through um, with the support of the computational tools and then the features we've kind of started adding in for those calculations. Uh, or in an actual screenshot of the page here, <clears throat> again, this idea that as you look at the data um, and you use the web page to have kind of a, a way to organize and visualize rather than just a menu of available structures, you can do a lot more in the web page. You can then seamlessly send these things to the, the viewers. And we've always used PyMol and Mo for the kind of small molecule chemistry. Um, and then in talking to Nano, that's where it's been kind of this novel area to explore in the virtual reality or upcoming mixed reality versions. Uh, so we'll get back to that in a bit. I just wanted to then step through a few more things on our, on our GIST platform. Um, but I think to keep you guys uh, interactive and awake, we have a few poll questions every now and then. And so Nana wanted to interject a few along the way. Uh, this would be our first one, which you get to click on your favorite or most used visualization softwares. Um, I recognize that people often use many, so this would be just kind of go with your most common. And we'll give it a few seconds to answer and get the results back. I feel like I should uh, whistle the Jeopardy theme or something, right? While we wait, what is, uh, what is, how does this question, how would you answer this question? Uh, I'm kind of a day-to-day -day mole is my easiest thing to get into. Um, obviously, I use Nano and we're exploring that. Uh, it's just a bit different to put on the headset. It's a bit more of like an invested uh, commitment to a session there where it's a uh, Pymol would jump in a lot. A lot of our, yeah, this is kind of similar. Like a lot of our EM folks use Chimera. And then as I mentioned, we have Mo uh, from CCG is kind of a very good suite for doing the actual building of, of small molecules and design is done often there. Nice. Great. Thanks for that participation. <clears throat> so jumping back along, let me get back to my presentation there. Um, this is then kind of where GIST is materialized. It's taken us a while to build. We're not a software company, but uh, we've got a, a good development team at the Roche site in Poland, and they've been helping do this along with uh, some of our scientists here. And uh, I'm really thrilled at, at how much it's now kind of coming to be, like following the vision I'd seen. And what I'm excited about are these, in particular, these linear data tracks, right? And so 
Other tools have some things like this, but this is a way we could do it for in-house structures as well. And the PDB has come a long way in this regard too. But so you see on each of these, like I've, I've loaded up a public structure, um, a KRAS one in this case, and you can see the PFAM domain definitions. Atomic means what was actually in the coordinates versus the sequence that's in the CRAS header of what went into the experiment. There's the overall conservation. There's specific conservation comparing human, in this case, to mouse or other species in that pull down. There's the protein ligand interactions. You can duplicate a track if there's more than one ligand. So this is a GDP in one case, and then a small molecule inhibitor in another pocket. And then all these color-coded blocks are you know, hydrogen bonds or van der Waals forces and so on. Um, and then there's protein-protein interfaces pre-calculated or the uniprot disease variants. So again, all this data is out there. As a structure biologist, people would often come and ask you like, oh, how conserved is this? And you'd have to run off and find like, how do I run conserve again? And where's my script that stuffs that in the B factors? And then it colored my B, you know, there's all these like workarounds that everything always took a few hours and you'd have to go find someone who knew how to do it. The point of this was to say, hey, even if you're not an expert in this field, we can bring you expert information and sophisticated access to tools. And what I think, you know, allows for serendipity is the idea of these, these cross connections, right? So I can quickly see in the GDP pocket, hey, there's a residue there that's different in human and mouse. I can see that it's pretty conserved, but where I'm right next to a less conserved region, or where do the disease mutations land in regard to ligand binding, and so on and so forth. So for me, this was just kind of what motivated me to make this type of tool, and uh, I thought it was a very powerful thing. And again, as I said, this is like fun in 2D on a web page, but we really want to be able to paint that into 3D too, right? Because as you know, things that are far apart in sequence space might be very close in 3D space and vice versa. Um, and so in this case, <clears throat> this little olive icon paints these over into Pymol. And so whatever the histogram data are um, and the coloring, you can project onto a 3D structure. In this case, you can see the binding pocket um, and then here's the conservation. And as I go down and click the different tracks, you can get versions overlaid, right, of the different protein-protein interfaces, the conservation, the disease mutations, the likely pathogenicity of those changes have been observed. You know, all of these available public data sets, but, but brought back to the structure. Um, and then another case, if you're not in the small molecule world, but maybe wondering about uh, an antibody, your FAB bound to your antigen. In this case was a structure I'd done some years ago, uh, FABs bound to angiopoid 2 as a target. <laughs> You can see I can make tracks for you know light chain or heavy chain bound to A, and when I click these, it lights up the epitope of the fab. And then if I wondered, well, is this going to be cross-reactive with mouse? Is my epitope conserved in mouse? Again, we have this pull down with um, you know sorted values for different species of similarity. I can choose the mouse. It shows me that highlight. Click the olive and instantly get a view in 3D of like, oh yeah, the epitope looks pretty conserved in human and mouse, but around the fringe down here, there's differences. Uh, so um, I hope that kind of stimulates your imagination. There's all kinds of things. We have a list of, I don't know, 20 or 30 different tracks we're going to add in there. One of them is user annotations. Um, so you can make your own information, annotate a structure and save it and share it with your colleagues. If you're reading a paper and it says, hey, we deleted this region, you know, 25 to 100. And when we did that, nuclear localization was abrogated. You can make little notes and things like that. And so then again, you can click on this and show it on 3D instantly. Um, you know, there's bringing in predicted binding pockets and lighting those up on structures, experimental data sets we have for, um, you know, like hydrogen exchange or NMR uh, detected shifts. And then mutagenesis design is one of the other things too. We're having algorithms that say, hey, I want to stabilize my protein. And it says, here's 20 positions that might help you. If you light those up, you now have a very easy way to cross-reference those to whether they're conserved or not or involved in, in ligand binding. And maybe you don't want to change those ones or, you know, you can make kind of educated and informed decisions around that. And just yesterday, we added our solvent accessibility track. So in blue is the things on the surface. Obviously, the interior is white, the outside is blue, but they're shaded by how much surface area. You know, you get a very quantitative measures as well. My example for the mutagenesis, too, was just taking something from Jason McClellan's lab at Texas, right, that helped make some of the best vaccines we've seen on the COVID protein. And they did that by stabilizing the spike protein and introducing prolines at six positions. And the constrained phi side backbones of prolines stopped it from being able to go into the post-fusion state because we want to be able to recognize the pre-fusion state of the virus, right? And so that was, um, you know, just a tour de force of kind of engineering and, and all their work on this type of protein had led to that. But something I think we can, you know, bring in quite quickly, we can make these algorithms for, <coughs> excuse me, any protein of, of interest and say, hey, if you wanted to stabilize a certain conformation over another, maybe it doesn't have to be as extreme as prolines even, but you could map these very easily into the 3D with these tools and kind of explore that way. I apologize a bit too, I've had this, this cough, so I hope it doesn't interrupt too much. But 
So that was kind of a whirlwind tour, but just hopefully giving a flavor of uh, the types of things we've been thinking about um, with these large data sets that we want to navigate and, and do it in a structural context. And so uh, sometimes I think like, great, you know, every day I'm going to be doing this. And even myself, I don't do it that much. Uh, so I was kind of curious about how people see these large data sets and how often you're actually in there thinking, is it kind of once on your project, you need to do it and then you kind of know and you don't have to do it again, or is it something you might do kind of weekly or, you know, up to you, um, but just kind of wondering how much people are are starting to dive into larger data sets as they analyze structures. Um, I guess uh, let Edgardo crack a joke to kill a bit more time, and then we'll. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, question: You know, with uh, mutagenesis, scaffolding motifs, ligand binding, and so many other mm -hmm. concepts, there's a lot, a lot of overlap. What sort of approaches do you have to layer that information? Do you superimpose multiple models and cycle or do you have combinatorial gradients yeah at the moment we're making kind of a separate object with each coloring scheme and so you have to turn them on and off a bit and so it's hard to blend i've been thinking about that though when you have things that are near two different um, information sources and you want to see like you know red and blue turns purple in the overlap uh, so we haven't done that as much yet we have heat maps and gradients for a given data set but if you're talking about seeing like all five of them together um, that's something we still have to kind of head towards I mean, we'll chat with you guys more about that. The post-processing multiple streams into one. Sounds good. Oh, that's almost like a little perfect bell curve there around monthly or rare. Yeah, I'm probably with the, the daily, weekly folks myself. So. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, and then just stepping through a couple last parts. Again, the small molecule world, I hadn't shown that as much yet. Um, but similarly, we have, as I showed, those, those little blocks of interactions. And when we click that one, instead of just lighting up the residues, it actually draws discrete vectors. What we're hoping to do is there's tools like from OpenEye that show you, hey, here's a missed opportunity for an interaction that's not being used. And we want to be able to light those up too, again, to kind of guide and recommend people towards um, suitable drug design as well. Um, but again, in, in PyMol, at least, you know, this makes individual ones. You can turn your van der Waals on and off or, or so on and so forth. These are coming from uh, a tool called Proasis, uh, written by Neil, Neil Taylor, Desert Scientific. But there's many flavors of protein ligand interactions. Nano has its own as well, right? And so you can do that in the VR world. Um, and it's great to sometimes compare them and see if they're consistent or different. And from that, you know, we have other algorithms that are running in our GIST platform that run OpenEyes FastRocks, for instance, which is a small molecule ligand shape-based search. So you give it a ligand, it can then in a few minutes on GPUs explore millions and millions of possible molecules for which ones give confirmations that give you a similar shape while providing different chemistries. So from that, you know, we have a nice kind of table we call our hit hopper, where you can line those up, you can calculate further drug-like properties doing these multi-parameter optimizations to pick out the winners. And I really think these interactive plots are super powerful. Um, and so you can quickly see those between, for instance, your score and fast rocks versus a calculated solubility or C log P in these cases and color them by, by other features. So this, this brings me to kind of the transition point where we were building these platforms. We were running it on PyMo and Mo. Um, but in some ways, you know, it felt like I wanted the science fiction type world, you know, you see those CSI programs are like enhance and suddenly like magically the, the detail that finds the killer is shown. That's kind of what we're trying to do in drug discovery, right? Or I had this Iron Man one or Tom Cruise and Minority Report where they're, you know, it seems fun and kind of a joke, but, uh, and we we're horsing around a bit as I went to pull and then we had this glass wall and my colleague Kieran was like, you got to go do the Minority Report thing behind that wall. So this is clearly not from Minority Report. Um, but it was funny when I first talked to Edgardo, these guys were going to first, but soon in, and Edgardo, it was a very deadpan delivery. He's like, oh, yeah, we're building Jarvis for molecules. I thought he was going to be joking. It was just like this very straight face. I was like, oh, you're not kidding. And, uh, you know, when you first kind of get in there and use it, it's, it's a really compelling and different environment. And uh, you can have voice commands and other things like that. So it really does start to feel like a... Um, a different kind of future or for those who grew up in the 80s you may recognize the immortal words of the smiths with how soon is now uh which you know, started to feel like we were further along than i'd realized uh, in what nanom had so this is just borrowing from nanom's web page you know they've got these great graphics up there but for those this audience i assume some have experienced it some maybe not um, it's really a, a rich environment small molecule building tools that are happening in the background here and just feeling like you're immersed in the the world, like some kind of Ant-Man superhero, right? You're down in this kind of molecular world and, and the ways of scale you can change and coloring and, and data again, bringing that data in is, is kind of critical. So this is just another view showing a lot of those different features <clears throat> when I was working with Steve and Edgardo in one of these settings. These are small molecule hits I was showing from that Fast Rocks program. Um, you can walk through those and they have the chemical property calculators in Nanome as well. 
and really, you know, you're diving inside the pocket of a protein and in a collaborative way too, right? You have these sketch pads and people can share uh, and look at that and really hold the molecules in your hand essentially. So I'm not like a super kind of gamer person and the VR stuff, I was a little skeptical myself going in, but I've certainly found it a very intuitive type of environment and a kind of a real change in perspective. People always ask things like, well, what do you find out that you didn't find out in 2D? And I can't say there's any one thing, but I can certainly say it's a very different type of experience and environment of the protein and a much more three-dimensional intuitive feel. So that's been really um, you know, great to explore and, and recommended for trying out. So the other part, I mean, the focus of this talk in a sense though, was this idea that we want to be able to integrate what I was building in this platform into the, the um, VR world, right? And so I didn't really have an icon. I'm just also playing around having fun in the preparation. I don't know if people know this Dolly too. It's a bit of a side comment, but Sam, I think was the first one who told me about this at Nanom. Um, you can type some words and it makes a picture. So I told it to make a pencil sketch of a chameleon with a VR headset, whatever. So it doesn't do so well with proteins. I think that's what these little spheres on its head are supposed to be. But anyway, that's my VR world on this side. And we had our platform on this side. Nanom had built great things to go to the PDB and they had a vault system where you could send files over. But for us, where we had like, you know, thousands and thousands of structures and files that we wanted to really kind of seamlessly go, sending them a few at a time through a vault wasn't going to be super effective. And so it really changed this and was a, a kind of a big breakthrough. And some of the other webinars in the past from other groups have mentioned the same, is having this web browser embedded in VR that Nano built. And so then I could directly access the web page just as if I was in kind of the normal world um, and do things through it that way. And you know, this allows us access to our job clusters. I said, our, our GIST platform runs computational jobs on our cluster and our GPU clusters. And so it's kind of a very nice, powerful way to bring algorithmic information back to the, the VR visualization as well. I would say too, there's a couple other uh, methods that Nano has for, for passing data. One is the plugins or their, their stacks. And so those also can be customized to listen on different ports and have data passage through. So we're using those as well. And then the deep linking side is another place that is kind of uh, another route that I haven't used as much yet, but we're hoping to do so. So this then uh, is a video showing like in the VR world, um, the whole web page comes up on a panel, uh, kind of like a movie screen and you can interact with it. Here I'm sorting through, as I showed the screenshots before in a static way, uh, some of the kind of um, small molecule search tools and the hits we have. But in front of it is, is the actual protein we'd be looking at. And, in the other world. And when you download on the web page, you can then go to the download section of the browser and say open a nano and it pops right in as a molecule, whether it's an SDF file or a PDB, so on and so forth. Um, so that's a great, as I said, a great conduit for that. The other part, you know, we still didn't have a button like I had for PyMole, which just sends it automatically. And that's what we will eventually do with deep linking. But in the meantime, the other route around it from just going to the web page was uh, building these plugins. And I really appreciate Alex and Sam on this front because we kind of described what we wanted. And then a couple of days later, they had, um, so I'm gonna just back up and rerun that one. They had built this up. So it's a little just panel, a plugin. And this is basically talking to the same endpoints that feed data to our web page, but now sends it straight over into Nanom and some Nanom scripts act on it. So you can see I've colored it by the conservation <clears throat> histogram. Then now it's colored by that uh, very surface area one, the BSA uh, on that front. So uh, again, a nice, a nice powerful route. So essentially, as I said, you know, we have these kind of JSON format data endpoints that are coming from our, our back end. And those feed the front end web page, but equally they can feed the plugins that talk to the nano world as well. And so that's great because we have kind of one consistent data format that we generate. And so for all these tracks, we could fairly quickly make different versions of the plugin to connect. And then as I said, there's this deep linking idea, which is you could eventually have a button here that while you look at the web page, you say, hey, paint my molecule, and, and it will do that automatically uh, through that route as well. I think that's something that uh, Nano told me three decision has done with their disk engine, or sorry, disk engine has done with their three decision app. Uh, three decision is a commercial app that's the most just like thing that I know of out there uh, commercially in terms of structure analysis and you know pocket finding and all these other types of uh, data environments for analyzing structures. So also worth really checking out talking to those guys. We've talked to them off and on as we both kind of develop things. They're you know software company for real and we're kind of doing this as a, on the side for a science. <clears throat> Um, and this is just, again, another example, whipping through uh, the fab and an antigen, uh, same example as before. But again, if you have that buried surface area, you want to see your epitope and highlight it quickly, you know, the single plugin point allows you to do that and, and have this shaded by the amount of buried surface area. So again, it's bringing a kind of a richer uh, information content than just saying, show me things that are nearby, uh, which is our typical uh, traditional way of doing that. 
Um, and again, that's kind of what's behind it, right? On these tables of amino acid by amino acid that PISA has calculated. We've pre-done this for every structure and it's there. So you can sort by the, the buried surface area in the interface and find which residues are giving the most contributions if you want to do engineering or, or other things. And it tells you if they're hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, antisulfides, and so on. Uh, so the other, the other final part of this is the idea that uh, with the headset on now, you don't actually have to leave. You're getting towards that you know Iron Man type environment where you're like, hey, I have this ligand. I want to find 500 other ligands that are just like it. And so through GIST, for instance, and you can do this other ways, but we're doing it through our, our platform, we can click, you know, here's that same structure I'm looking at in the VR world, launch the job, and a couple of minutes later, um, you know, 500 hit, come back in the SDF. Uh, in the movie there, I was just pulling them off the website. And they pop up in 3D. You can align them because they were done in the same frame of reference. And so then as we zoom in on the pocket in this video, um, you have the advanced panel in Nano, which allows you to step through all those frames of the SDF in each individual molecule. And you can see just behind the hand there, there's those ranking systems. So you could pick out you know, which are your favorites, which things are worth further investigation. And then Nano has also added a table, a data table viewer. And so you can kind of sort these favorites uh, within the nanome environment as well to, to kind of proceed. So it's a really becoming a, a fluid and um, you know accessible drug design environment essentially with all that data. Um, I'm gonna say the real world version of you in the VR is not always so cool looking. Uh, here's us on the left, but we are trying it with some pilot teams. I'm throwing some of our med chemists under the bus here along with me. Uh, it was funny because one of the postdocs was coming late and she opened the door and she just apparently looked and she told me later, she's like, I just backed away, you know, I didn't want to come in. <laughs> um, that's just kind of being facetious. But on the other hand, too, I'd say like this immersive environment is fantastic. But with the release of this Quest Pro uh, and Nanom's involvement in that, uh, they have a lot of things that are turning into a pass through one. And so you would actually see the molecule in your space as well. And so we're really excited to try some of this out with the mixed or augmented reality that's coming. So when you are in the room with people, you can still see the people you're with. Um, and when you're further apart, obviously in different countries or whatever, it's nice to be um, the collaborative environment. But I think these are some really uh, nifty looking ways to, to work as well that are coming. Ah, so here's Nanom's uh, third question. Make sure you're all still there. And uh, I assume that, you know, if you're here at a Nanom webinar, you're probably interested, but you can ask the question how you like. Mm -hmm. Right. Actually, I had a question here. Um, and by the way, if anybody else on the Zoom has questions, there is a Q&A button on the bottom side of the Zoom where you can uh, post your questions and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. <clears throat> Looks pretty good. Strong interest and in some already there. And if you still on the fence, I'm going to win you over in this last part. <laughs> well, it's up to nano too, but hopefully you like structure biology, which is my side of it. Um, <clears throat> jump back to my slides. So I'm just going to, in the closing part, third of it or so, walk through uh, some of the things in GIST that I think take us beyond just the structure viewing. Uh, Nanome, you know, can view 3D things, so why not the data itself as well? And so one of the things we've added in GIST, which I think is a bit unusual, I don't know of other places you can do this as much, are these measurements. So if you make a collection of structures, just aligns them, it stores as a collection, you can then pick in your reference structure, you know, fiducial atoms that outline distances or angles or dihedrals, and it will go through your whole collection and measure them for those as well. And so in a kinase, for instance, we have these conserved DFG motifs, um, and there's a researcher, Henrik Mobitz at Novartis, who found out that the determined the dihedral angles of that DFG are really good at categorizing not just, you know, DFG in and out that we colloquially talk about for active and inactive kinases, but some subtleties and, and ranges within that, as well as these distances to the conserved helix C, which is in blue here, and so on and so forth. So I can mark this all up these ways. It measures each of these columns um, across when as long as there's atoms there, some of them are disordered in places. But then you see you can sort by these features. So I can put like hundreds of hundreds of structures into this order by their conformation, which is uh, you know hard to do in most databases, which just have a list of like that structure one, that structure two. You don't really know what's going on in the structure. And I love again these plots <clears throat> that you can make, and so you can see that hey, here's a, 
a couple hundred kinase structures, and they're actually quite different from each other, even though they're all lumped in a pool as like these are our structures with inhibitors. Um, chain A and B are, have different conformations in this asymmetric dimer, um, and then even there you can see there's a range of plasticity in the, in the motions of that kinase. And these are interactive plots, so I can lasso some of the points uh, in the corner um, and then filter those down and, and send just those to the viewer. And the idea really is like, you know, if I showed you this structure and said, hey, is that a DFG in or out kinase? It's, you know, is it even a kinase, right? I mean, it's hard to tell. Obviously, we can we can dive in and we can figure those things out, but it takes some time. And the idea here was that in an instant, you can basically position um, your new structure on this map of like 8,000 other examples from the PDB uh, and the kinase. Again, and this is, again, that reference from Henrik Hobbits. Uh, which was really fantastic, right? Otherwise, you're off reading 500 papers trying to figure out if any other kinase has ever done this before or one by one aligning structures. So I love these kind of these quantitative tools and uh, computational methods to, to explore data that way. But essentially, these plots, you know, I was envisioning that why not walk through them in the VR world? Again, I jumped to Dali 2 and asked it to draw a scientist in a lab coat walking in a cloud of data. Um, so we got something like this out of that. Uh -oh. You know, impressive, but essentially then you could kind of reach out to each of these points, which represents the structure, and pull it and kind of open up and look at the structure and then maybe put it back in the graph, almost like the graph is your, your cupboard um, or your fruit tree, you know, like the kinome tree growing little proteins of interest that you can pick from it. So these were just other thoughts, you know, to nano. And I think as people have seen, <coughs> sorry, uh, with these recent announcements of the AlphaFold universe of structures and now ESM's um, atlas of you know 800 million structures, which are now in this kind of universe projection in some kind of, I don't know what the plot is, like a TSNE data reduction plot or something with clustering. But wouldn't it be kind of neat to actually fly through that as a 3D object and find your structures and, and understand the relationships there as well. So, so that's kind of the direction things are headed. Um, you know, it's been a great kind of partnership. We haven't had quite as much bandwidth as I'd like to keep doing everything we could do. Um, there's so much going on, but we're certainly, you know, always excited and, and Nano is always enthusiastic and, and helpful on these fronts, as you'll find if you haven't already. Um, and so we're, we continue to build things too. And as I said, a lot of tools in Nano do some of the stuff that we have. Uh, and so they're available to anyone using that. And at the bottom of both of our lists, you know, I'm not trying to speak for Nano, I'm kind of check this with them, but I think we're all heading towards these machine learning AI methods. Uh, just due to the transformative power that they're showing on these large data sets. And as I'm pointing out, if we have you know, three quarters of a million macromolecular chains, that's billions of atoms that we can kind of investigate and use to train models uh, as we go forward. And so that's really, I mean, people are fully aware this has kind of been transforming the field of structured biology, first with um, a remarkable advances from AlphaFold that of course were built on Dave Baker and other structure folding prediction methods that came before it, um, but really the advance in precision and first they had a million and now 200 million models. And then quickly there's Rosetta Fold, OpenFold, you know, now this meta AI version structure predictions um, and how we can eventually have models that will take a pocket. This is um, our own work in this area recently. Uh, we did kind of a parlor trick version, but we trained a model to look at distances and say, where would you put atoms? And this, again, I said, is just kind of a, a quick, cheap thing. We took hundreds of shortcuts, but I was pleased that it, it put things in the little catcher's myth there of the pocket, right? And that was just generative design into a pocket. Um, it's not great things here. You can see clash and so on, but there's similar papers like this just coming out a few weeks ago. Uh, from groups with Tom Blundell and others here that were showing, um, you know, these machine learning models that are have this percolating pot of atoms or points in a pocket until it eventually materializes into an actual ligand. Um, we've tried to start to play around with this. I'm not sure if it always makes a real ligand like this. We've had some, but, you know, I'm really excited and open-minded about the data that is coming out, how it's viewing and interpreting the pocket. And a lot of what I've showed you is really thinking of these, these proteins as like different layers. You can look at them, right? Almost like David Attenborough narrating a nature show where he's like, oh, insects see this flower in UV or something and you get a different view. Or, so we have the same type of thing. I want to see it in conservation. I want to see it in disease potential. I want to see it in um, you know, dynamics or motions and alignments. And we can really extract all this information and help build it. So uh, with that, just, yeah, I'm really kind of wrapping up. Again, thanks for that opportunity. I hope it's uh, insightful or, or helpful for your guys' efforts. I'm curious to hear what other people are doing. And a big thanks to our team here, our development team for GIST, Kieran Mukiala in particular, my colleague, who's really been a, a, a great partner in the development of everything we've done with GIST. And then thanks to Nano. This is only a partial list, um, but I've interacted with many of you over the last few years. And uh, it's always great and you know, insightful, enthusiastic. So thanks, everyone. And I think we can do some of the Q&A. Thank you so much, Seth. Wonderful presentation. So yeah, we do actually have a couple questions coming in. And again, if you have your own question, 
feel free to leverage the Q and A button on the bottom side of bottom bar of the Zoom uh, window. So let's go into the first question here. What aspects of VR do you find the most relevant in your daily research activity? <clears throat> I think for me at the moment, it's still just the the different sense of the space and the protein. And so if I'm in a pocket or looking between protein interfaces, it's just a much more tangible kind of 3D feel for it. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't say that translates into, and then aha, I can find a drug, but it's, as I said, it's certainly different and an immersive experience. Uh, you know, at some point where I'm wondering, like, would, will we end up getting force feedback on the hands or something? So you could grab a bond and you can almost feel how strong the bond is or you know, break it over your knee or something, get a very tangible feel for it. Uh, and so in the VR, there's that for an individual use. And then I would say too, that the collaborative nature of that environment that Nano has built is really super. And so um, we haven't gone in too frequently as teams, but when you do, it's pretty wild how you know the voice audio and things just feels like you're in a 3D space with someone. Uh, and so when people are, as I said, in different countries and things, that, that collaborative world uh, really is helpful compared to Zoom meetings and stuff we've all been doing so much of in the last years. So another question, what drove you to develop the GIST VR integration? Um, I think that was curiosity about the VR side. I mean, as I said, we had like, you know, Pymol and Mo and our kind of traditional 2D viewers and you can wear 3D glasses and get stereo projectors. Um, but it just seemed like a logical thing. And in talking in part to, you know, the folks at Nano and how much they had similar interests and, and ideas along the lines of, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could bring more data in as we're looking through structures and how do the data content we have affect what we do when we look at structures? Uh, made it feel like it's something that was just kind of a, a fluid environment that we might be able to really experience something different in as we go forward. Um, yeah, so that, that's most of it. I mean, you know, we can do things traditionally, but if you just keep doing the same way, there's no real change. So uh, it's good to explore, I guess, part of that. <clears throat> okay. So we have another question on the technology side. Does Nanom use HoloLens 2 or other VR headsets, uh, which is compatible? Does this process limit to integrate scenes in Unity? So Nanom uh, is hardware agnostic when it comes to virtual reality hardware. Unfortunately, we're not compatible with HoloLens 2 since that's an augmented reality device, but we are building the technology in a way that will be AR ready when the devices are ready. It's more of a computational limitation on the devices. Um, but uh, yeah, here's another question for you, Seth. Have you tried out using hotspot an analysis to compare your GIST analysis for example, disease association mutations with putative binding pockets to bias the decisions that you make about which pocket to follow in a discovery project? Um, yes and no. Like we haven't fully done that yet, but we have, those are a couple of tracks we have coming. One is pocket predictions, and we also have a hotspot database for kind of covalent modified residues uh, where those land on proteins. So yeah, that's in the whole suite of like aligned information that we want to be able to cross-reference and kind of cross-pollinate. Um, and then certainly this type of platform is being, you know, used and now steered towards, and we're happy to have that collaboration spring up, the idea of target qualification decisions. So when you tackle a new protein, we can very quickly say, hey, here's three predicted pockets. Here's what we know about hotspots and the databases of those. Here's what we know about disease locations from the human genetics group uh, that we collaborate with at Genentech and so on. So yeah, it's certainly that's part of the whole data suite that we're trying to do to get a really again, this kind of full picture of, of the protein. And, you know, as many people have talked with, we're kind of like, you know, it's not rocket science. All that data is out there. The idea was really just that it's it's kind of piecemeal. You have to go and look in different places and different databases. And what if we built this kind of hub that really pulls it all together? Um, and again, I think what happens then is that you get this serendipity of like, hey, I never noticed that this residue is also, you know, mentioned in that database when you look at them separately. There's a couple of similar questions around availability of GIST um, as a commercial software. Is it freely available? Uh, any thoughts around that? Yeah, uh, certainly thoughts around it. One is, no, it's not. Um, we're still building it ourselves and we're, we're far from done. So we're, that's kind of taking all our time. Because again, as I said, we're not like a software company, but we do hope to publish it. Um, we're champions of open source stuff in general. Uh, and so, you know, it just takes kind of 
probably a lot more resources and energy for us to be able to do that. So I'm kind of presenting it here as hopefully inspiration and mentioning there are some commercial things like three decision that you could check out in the meantime. Uh, we do hope to get some publications out and, uh, you know, kind of make it more broadly accessible or at least components of it uh, that might be quite useful broadly. So um, philosophically aligned with that, just practically, we haven't had any bandwidth to kind of head in that direction yet, but it's getting there. Yeah, and as Seth mentioned in the presentation, we do have a partnership with Disk Engine. And so if you are interested, feel free to reach out to them directly, or we can also connect you. Let's see. How does developing the integration process work with Nano if we want to use our own internal or external tool? So Nano has a Python-based API that can communicate with all sorts of different computational tools. And so as long as uh, you know we can establish a, a good communication uh, between our two organizations, uh, both technically and um, uh, from a uh, aligned on priorities as well, then uh, we should be able to make things happen. Yeah, I would. I would kind of add to that too. I think. I think Nano's. If I can speak for you, per perception is kind of like they hope we can get trained up and then walk on our own and build our own, and that's totally true. I mean, as I said, there's this Python API, and we we would eventually. On our side too, we just haven't had a lot of extra resources, so we've been leaning a bit more on Nano. And uh, I would just thank you guys again; you've been super helpful in kind of whipping up a few kind of starting examples and getting us going and helping along the way. So I don't know if you know you have the bandwidth to do that for everyone, but certainly I think as these these tools get shared, that's kind of a pretty um, feasible and accessible way to build those. Yeah. There's a question around: um, Is this platform? open for academic investigators slash collaborative efforts. So if you're referring to GIST, it sounds like it's an internal tool. If you're referring to Nanome, uh, Nanome is available to download uh, via our website. Just visit nanome.ai forward slash setup, and you should be able to download it. Um, yep. Yeah, and the, the gist part, like it, it is still our internal tool, as I said for the earlier question, like eventually we hope to publish it and make it more accessible, but it'll probably be a little while as we still have a mountain of things we're trying to build into it. A question for you. Uh, do you envision a point where nano slash VR could replace 2D visualization, for example, Pymol, to extend your daily work? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to, you could do it now. I don't yet you know, want to put on a headset and wear it all day long. Uh, and so my daily work just tends to be interrupted a lot. So that's why I kind of jump in and out and do some pie mole for a few minutes and then I'm going to run to a meeting. But the capabilities and the features are all there to do this effectively. Um, and I think what's helping and will help that further are these kind of lighter weight headsets or the pass-through ones where uh, you don't feel completely, you have to jump and commit to this other world, but you can see people around you as you work and the molecules can float on there as well. Um, so I, I don't know what the whole metaverse ideas are coming out of meta and things, but um, certainly, yeah, it's it's doable now on a daily basis. You could do a lot of work in there. Cool. There's another question here. I love the idea of VR for drug development. Any workaround for non-Oculus owners? Yeah, as mentioned, uh, we are hardware agnostic. So Oculus, Meta, uh, HTC, um, HP, uh, mixed reality devices, those are all compatible. Let's see. Another question here for you, Seth. Great presentation, Seth. From your perspective, to which extent does VR contribute to decision-making to push molecules and synthesis in MedChem projects versus non-VR-based decision-making? Yeah, that's kind of a, the big question. I can't say we're there yet and have enough experience to answer that fully. Our hope is that it's used alongside. We'll probably still continue for quite a while doing traditional kind of 2D uh, viewing. And, um, you know, we have rooms with 3D projectors and we sit in those and, and share that way. And then additionally, we'd have, we really just have a few pilot teams that have started trying it out. Um, you know, our limitations of VR, just to be clear and transparent, we've on our side at Genentech, have had IT issues where it's hard for us to keep the thing accessible and running for everyone. And there's a bit of a learning curve for new users. Um, you know, Nanom's built a very rich uh, environment and that requires kind of figuring out how to go. Some people take to it very quickly. Other people, you know, they arrive in VR and 
kind of walk into the walls and things. Uh, so it's interesting to see, but I think as these teams and people get used to it, it's, it's certainly uh, will will be growing and possible. So, but yeah, we're, we're at this kind of pilot stage. We're still hooking up a few things, uh, work in progress with some of the stuff I showed you. And then my hope is that these things do lead to decisions that push molecules forward, but I don't know if it's going to be, you know, particularly because they came from VR. So it's like the VR will be a nice collaborative environment that we're, we can work in efficiently. Um, and so molecules come out of that there and they could come out of other routes as well. Right. Um, so I see it not as like, it has to change the world and be discoveries happen only in that environment. It's more like another tool you can have alongside your existing ones. Um, and people may appreciate it. Those who take to it. Great. I think uh, one last question here for you. Thanks for the great talk. What's the main impact of GIST since its launch at Genentech? Um, yeah, it's in a similar stage where we've kind of been building the infrastructure and really in the last five or six months gotten to a point where we can now like kind of push it to users. Um, and so uh, what's grat I don't know if I have one single main impact. What's gratifying is the number of kind of collaborations that have started to emerge as people say, hey, I've always wanted to ask, like, can I find all 500 of these or E3 ligases for degradation projects or, you know, how do I compare hundreds of structures and find everything they bind to? And so the API that we built underneath just um, Kieran and Thomas Downs, one of the other contractors we have working with us in the, in the acknowledgement list, um, really have made something that's very powerful and very flexible. And so you can ask and say, hey, I want to find things that have no predicted PFAM domains and might be disordered, or I want to find things that have a transmembrane domain plus this. And you know, we can pull out all the sequences and all the all the structures that are relevant uh, quite quickly through this kind of simple language that we've built for our own Python API. And so I think that's where the big impact is coming is in these large scale programmatic tools. And yes, it has a, a great impact uh, for individual users who go in and, and say, hey, I just want to look at that structure I used to look at, but now there's all these extra data layers. So yes, yeah, it's, it's those two things I think hand in hand, but I think it's it's really the early stages of, of what we hope it will grow into. And, uh, you know, hopefully ask me in a year or so, and uh, I'll have some big, big impact answers. <laughs> I hope. Is there a is there a difference between how much you use Nanom for one visualization versus two calculations like small molecule docking? Would you say? Yeah, at the moment we're more heavy on the visualization side uh, in our experiences and attempts, in part because you know we were building the the GIST platform to do a lot of our calculations. So I haven't relied as much on uh, Nanom's built-in tools, uh, but they're there. I'm kind of aware of them. We just haven't jumped in as yet, as much yet to do the calculations. Uh, via the nanom tools uh, but it's something i keep meaning to do more of and explore and as i said as you know people know that every tool gives a slightly different answer so it's sometimes worth comparing multiple approaches that's what you get but yeah at the moment we're, we're mostly kind of visualization and we're bringing in computation from from gist in our case great awesome well once again so thank you so much for your time and your presentation it was absolutely wonderful and uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and end this webinar here and transition over to uh, the Nano VR portion of this event. Thanks. And thanks to everyone for coming too. It's hard. I can't see people. I've been talking to my computer, but uh, I guess it's a little still weird to me that we're going to go meet in these headsets now, but <laughs> see you over in VR, I guess. Thanks, Edgardo. <laughs>